And welcome to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. I'm your host, Shane Rayo 2, coming to you from the Fear of Capaznia, the self creator's paradise. Uh, to learn more about this uh, burgeoning parallel network, uh, just visit Paznia, P A Z N I A dot com. Uh, newer listeners, uh, newer listeners, and uh, there are many. Uh, one piece of advice that I have forgot to provide for uh, for some time. Uh, we highly recommend going back and uh, starting at Season 1, uh, Episode 1. Uh, season 1 covers the important philosophy of Anu, uh, some of which we only really uh, redefine and summarize now. Uh, season 2 covers the practice of Anu, uh, but only those things that Old Man Rayo discussed uh, or practiced, uh, waiting for various Vanu zines in the 1960s and uh, 1970s. Uh, then, in this ever-growing Season 3, we continue to expand Vanu into the modern day. You can find the episodes on any podcatcher uh, or visit vanupodcast.com forward slash episodes uh, for the full archive. Uh, all right, Kyle. Uh, welcome back, brother. Uh, how are you today? Oh, not too bad. Same old, same old, I suppose. How about yourself? Um, pretty good. Um, yeah, pretty pretty good. It's been a very productive week, and I've had, a, I guess, a little bit of a vacation, you could say. It's a little a partial, partial vacation, my... Um, the distillery was down, or I guess we weren't working at the distillery for a week or so. Um, sorry, I wasn't working there, um, but I had a really productive weekend at the homestead. I got, uh, um, <clears throat> I got our, uh, before my dad left uh, for vacation, um, we got a, uh, um, a DC water pump, um, solar powered water pump, um, put into the pond and, um, got the hose. I just had to go get a, a deep cycle battery for the uh, solar panel setup that was uh, donated by our, our, uh, our fellow uh, friend and Pasney and John, um, and uh, so yeah, we've got uh, um, and I got the uh, soaker hoses all around, uh, you know, ran out around the garden. Um, so we've got um, for our big garden out there, um, it's totally free solar powered water from the pond. Um, so it's uh, um, first experiment with solar, and uh, this you know, these are bigger panels, but um, I'm definitely looking at like uh, you know a smaller solar set of potentially, um, and just you know setting one, setting these up all over the property and having basically you know. Um, Free water, obviously the the pond isn't available in all those locations, but anyway, it's it's a good step, um, definitely a good step. It sounds like a worthy venture, especially when you have a little bit of help like that. I'll say that much. Yeah. A little bit, little bit of mutual aid has come your way. Oh yeah, um, no, I mean uh, there's there's been so uh, um, this was uh, I guess yeah it was one of his, one of his many donations of Paznia. Um, yeah, it's it's nice. Um, people come here and you know um, have stuff they can't necessarily use, but we can use on a homestead, um, like a really really nice uh, 400 watt cent energy solar panel setup. Um, so um, yeah, lots lots of you know yeah certainly appreciated certainly appreciated. Um, but yeah, I guess that's that's pretty much uh, pretty much it for now. Um, yeah, nothing, nothing really else to report. So I guess let's uh, let's 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 get on with it. Um, so yeah, last time Kyle and I revisited a uh, um, a few Vanu home bases uh, and shelters, uh, van nomadism, pedestrian nomadism, uh, living on a sailboat, um, uh, and a few subset uh, bases and shelters. Uh, today our goal is to revisit Vanu in cities, uh, underground, semi underground, semi underground structures. Uh, radical housing, uh, that is, floating hotels, airship homes and communities, decommissioned aircraft carriers. And then if we have time, uh, which I really don't think we will, um, so I won't even mention that. We aren't gonna, we'll do the Great, great Pesnia rundown another time. So, um, yeah, I uh, um, got some comments on YouTube uh, from last week. I guess from last, from this part one. And uh, um, uh, at Jan John McAfee on YouTube says, uh, um, from the grave, I guess, uh, once you're in water surrounding Canada, you encounter fisheries and wildlife. Uh, they can search your entire boat if they think you have an extra clam or oyster. Uh, and sailboaters do like to stop to resupply. Uh, they have their own boats, but more often they just sit at boat ramps and marinas where people come back in. So it sounds like if you don't come back in, you're for the most part okay around Canada, potentially, you know, maybe right off the coast. Um, and uh, John McAfee also said, if you can limit yourself to an e-bike with a cargo trailer, you can go long distances, gravel roads, public land, charge for free at any outlet with an extension cord, etc. All with no slave tags, no registration, no ID required. Uh, best way to test this is a summer e-bike camping trip. And uh, this was not the first time. I think Henza was the one that brought this up to me the first time. But um, e-bike, e-bikes, the e-bikes are kind of revolutionary now um, in terms of like a, you know like a solo venue or even I guess you know. If, if, for, you know, a couple could do with two with two e-bikes, but um, I mean, <clears throat> yeah, it's a uh, um, it's a pretty pretty interesting interesting idea. Um, 
Oh, and he and if he went further, I guess someone else commented. Um, Wacht said, uh, "In my area, people live in government forest land and cabins they built uh, by getting to getting to them with quads and dirt bikes. The issue is these engines are loud and in a forest valley, you can hear them from a mile away. It makes it more likely your place will be found by people who might steal from it, um, not cops. They don't go out that far. E-bikes can be close to silent and are also good for hunting with. Um, so I, you know, I intended because um, this is kind of like we we talked about uh, pedestrian nomadism and you know maybe you know you know by, you know a, a bike or something like that, but um, like an e-bike, um, the and yeah, an, an e-bike with like a small a small solar panel setup. I mean, um, I get the vision, um, you know, Rayo back in the and as polyethylene a tent, you know, on a typewriter. Well, it'd be it'd be very easy for a no, for like for a nomad like a small solar solar panel setup um, to power you know like a low power laptop, low power hotspot. And to be like, you know, like a, a digital blogger out there in the middle of the woods, um, you know, per se, um, or whatever that, whatever the heck it is. But um, it's, uh, it's, it's very interesting. Um, very interesting. Um, obviously, they're the other, um, as with them, with any other nomadic lifestyle, kind of the, there's only so much you can carry with you um, or take with you. Um, so, yeah, there's other, other factors. But I guess, have you ever, have you ever thought about the e-bike idea? Um, and I guess, so. Uh, what are your, what are your thoughts? Maybe that wouldn't come through clearly. Oh, okay. Yeah, like a, an electric bike um, that you could plug in yeah. and charge, or maybe, maybe I don't, maybe there's a solar power setup that can do it slowly. I, I don't know, um, but yeah, it's an, an electric bike. Um, so basically, consider like uh, taking, a, yeah, just yeah, a, a wilderness fawny lifestyle with an with an electric bike um, that you don't need slave tags for, um, well, etc. Yeah, yeah. No, my my bad, I I misheard. So. You know, it's funny. I guess this would probably be the time for a little story time about the shooters in downtown Austin. So I'm assuming what you're talking about is not exactly the same thing as the shooter thing, no. although for people in the first... Yeah, because the people in the first realm, that's their thing. And, and you know, it, it's, a sharp, uh, it's a sharp dichotomy. There's a lot of the 20-something Zoomers and whomever else that love them scooters. And then there's literally everybody else. Boomers, X, most malign words. I just fucking hate it because the Zoomers just, you know, basically just lay them out on the sidewalk or sometimes in the middle of the road and so forth. And, you know, I mean, yeah, you collect your credit card or whatever else and use your Federal Reserve notes to rent the scooter for a little bit. But again, that's for a inner city urban type area that's controlled by the first realm, isn't it? I mm-hmm. um, you're, you're talking survival society pretty hardcore, where you've got vagrants on the, on the streets and under the bridges and so forth, and whenever they're not panhandling or being weirdly aggressive towards people because they pretty much have lost their minds, usually in large part to some sort of narcotics addiction, illicit or otherwise, uh, the long and the short of it is nobody likes the people on the scooters. So what you're talking about is not that. No. No, I mean no, not. De- I mean definitely not. I mean these are these are just like they're. It's like if you get like a uh, if you get like a mountain bike, just consider like a mountain bike with a small like a, I guess a, a small battery powered engine. Um, yeah, like like yeah, that's that's the best way to th- the best way to think about it. Um, it's got you know kind of bigger tires too, so again you can take your electric bike you know so off grid. Yeah. So, so would it be like closer to in some ways to like hypothetically? Had Tesla come out with a mountain bike electric type thing, it would be the kind of thing more or less. Um, a lot more, a lot smaller scale. Yeah, like to where it's small enough to where yeah, the, there's no. There, I mean, they haven't. Um, oh, um, eventually they'll probably want to you know have licenses and regulations for them, but they aren't there yet. So yeah, again, you can you can do it. It's it's like a. Um, yeah, I mean, it, I think it'd be heaven for you know for for Rayo back in the, back in those days because well, yeah, the, the one of the biggest things I hate about uh, about uh, van nomadism was the slave tags and yeah, that doesn't happen with electric bikes and you you could to- I mean it you could totally um, yeah I mean it could be very very self contained um, at least uh, electrically um, potentially and and I guess if if you had uh, if you had little uh, well, I don't know I, I guess I'll have to I'll, I'll have to look into it a little more but yeah I'll stop there for a moment. Well, I would say that pretty much any form of transportation that relies on a form of energy that's not, you know, compressed dead plants, also known as oil, is definitely a step in the right direction. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, like, for example, like the Teslas, which at this juncture are mainly the, you know, four wheels and internal combustion engine and a chassis with a automobile body thrown on top of it. Um, it's fine for cars, I suppose, but then again, 
you know, cars can only go so many places, right? Motorcycles and bikes and all that can go a lot of places that cars can't. Uh, and it's not just by virtue of two wheels. Um, as, as anybody who's even tried to ride a motorcycle versus drive a car can tell you, uh, it's a very different experience having an internal combustion engine between your legs instead of either in front of you or with some sport cars behind you. It feels completely differently. Mm -hmm. So in terms of some sort of wilderness Vanu application, uh, yeah, sure. I mean, like less noise, uh, less pollution, less energy consumption in general, the affordability of the type of energy in question, and then other types of considerations like carrying capacity and so forth. Yeah, I mean, if these uh, conveyances uh, have proven themselves, or even if they're still being field tested to be used in that kind of application, I mean, why the hell not? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you got to avoid the bludge somehow. Yeah. Definitely better than a damn scooter. <laughs> right. No, I'm, I'm I'm with you. I'm with you. It definitely needs uh definitely needs more exploration. But thankfully, it's not like um it's not like uh I know you, I know you can rent vans too. But even if you wanted to buy an e bike, it's not um I don't think it's it's definitely not near as expensive as a as a as a van or even renting a van or or the complications that come with renting a vehicle um or like something that's you know maybe cost more than just like renting a you know a, renting a car you know um that might be more I guess they might want more assurances. Um, for the rentals. So I guess the good thing is there's there's less hurdles if you want to try this out. Um, uh, yeah, I don't think they're really that. Yeah, I don't think they're that expensive. I didn't look into prices, but um, yeah. Anyway, something something to look into more, and uh, something I'm you know I'm curious about. If anyone out there has uh, you know hasn't one of these e bikes, has any uh, um, yeah has any uh, you know anything to report, uh, we'd love we'd love to hear it. Um, so I guess that covers the uh, the Facebook, or I guess not the Facebook comments. I haven't been on Facebook in six years. I don't know why, I, why that came up. Um, but yeah, that, w that was the, the YouTube comments. Um, so I guess uh, if there's nothing else on e-bikes, we can get back to, uh, to we can get to, uh, I guess, get back to our, uh, I guess, our series um, outline here. Um, Vonnie and Cities Revisited. Um, so I guess, uh, yeah, I guess, uh, um, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll turn it over to you first. Um, it's been oh, what five, six years since we talked about Vonnie and Cities. I should have brought up the episode like I did last time, um, but I'll bring it up when you when you start talking. Um, it's been a quite a while since we talked about Vonnie and Cities. Uh, where are your where are your thoughts now um, on that as a potential Vonnie lifestyle? Well, I don't have the list in front of me, so if you haven't had the article popped in front of you, that would be good time to sure. bring, it I'll bring it up right now. But I do remove them about one of them being van nomadism in uh, city squat spots. I'm less inclined towards that now, um, mainly because what people had is Hey, Kyle. Other people who are non sorry, or sorry other man. It's uh, okay. It's, it was a little choppy for the past okay. like 15 seconds or so. Um, yeah, a little bit, a little more of a choppier connection today, I think. Um, but it was starting to clear up right towards the end. So maybe, I guess, maybe back up 10 or 15 seconds. Um, I think you said you were kind of backing away, but backing away from it. Um, but yeah, it was choppy. So maybe try again. I think we might be okay. All right, testing. One, two, three, testing. Uh, I think so. Maybe, maybe we'll go for it. Hopefully, it works. Okay, well, the only thing I was really going to say was that I've, I've been really kind of rethinking van nomadism with city squad spots. And the reason why is because, how do I put this? So there have been people, whether they be the new ones or not, who have been taking the trailers and whatever else and basically parking in the Walmart parking lot uh, overnight because Walmart allows that kind of thing, or at least they used to. I don't know the current status of that. Everyone, please go double check on that one. The long and short, and why this is something I'm reconsidering, is because it is now well known also that vagrants and other hostile actors against the villains and, and whoever else, uh, lagging grounds, hunting grounds, predatory grounds, whatever kind of grounds. And then, of course, wherever the vagrants are, once they start enough of a commotion, once they start doing their typical burglary stuff, their typical sexual assaults and such and whatnot, 
you know, professional career such as it is and work in private security, the bloodthirsty to follow. Once it escalates severely enough into, you know, felony territory. So the uh, so we go back to mean time to harassment. We go back to MTH yet again for the 20 million times. And so when it comes to Van Madison and City Squat Spots, it's really coming down to the quality of the City Squat Spot itself. And something like the Walmart parking lot, I think, is the last place that should be used as a City right. Squat Spot when practicing Van Madison. Now, that being said, I do think one possible alternative, which is very hit and miss because it depends on the area, it depends on the history, it depends where it's located, and so on and so forth, there are some industrial parks in some urban outlying areas where you could spend one night or two and not draw too much attention, especially if it's over a weekend. Weekend being defined as Friday, Saturday night. When all the money through Friday, first round for about 50 people have gone home for the weekend and are off duty. That is one way of potentially conceiving of it. I know there's other options which will not be mentioned here right now, but suffice it to say, I don't think Vandama and the city squat spots in terms of practicing violent cities is, um, it, it, I think it's becoming, I, I think the, the MTH is going lower, not higher, because the yeah. bloods are a lot more sensitive to it now. Because they're, look, they're just following the felonies. They're following, they're following the felonies of the stuff that even they can't ignore. And over and over and over again, I've noticed some of this is happening too when I was at work as well. Um, they're going to the Walmart parking lots. Like the Walmart parking lots now have the reputation of being exceedingly dangerous. And that's even for normal, in this context, normal person, you know, Federal Reserve notes and then walk right out. They're not spending the night. So in that context, they're normal. Um, it's dangerous even for them to do it. So never mind the people that, you know, for whatever reason, uh, again, whether it might be by choice or not, are spending the night there. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've heard of an area or a small town. I don't think that even matters. Stay away from Walmart. Like, yeah. it attract, I mean, there's a the whole thing about people at Walmart, that website. Yeah, that's, 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 a, you know, that's that kind of store, that corporation attracts a certain type of clientele for a reason. You know, this isn't about making anybody feel bad or being prejudiced. This, this is a legit safety issue. And as such, it does dovetail with what we care about as Venuans in terms of, you know, practicing a certain amount of deception, a certain amount of defense, a certain amount of those other things, those good, uh, those good Venuan principles and so forth, when we're trying to gain a greater invulnerability to coercion. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, you can't really be said that we've gained or growing, or shall we say a higher MTH, if we're right at the ground zero of where the bloods are going to show up and throw people to the ground, whether they deserve it or not. I'm, we're not even getting into that part. It's just like, where are the bloods going to be? The bloods are going to be where when the vagrants are pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed, and now there's some Vic with her pants around her ankles with some blood around her, because I've seen some of that. Mm. Okay, So I say this not to scare anybody. I say that the whole Van of Asma City squat spot needs to be radically reconsidered. And I still think industrial park uh, parking lots in some areas at some time, and especially over the weekend, is a much more viable uh, possible alternative than a Walmart parking lot. Right. No, I, I'm 100% I'm with you, man. 100% um, with you. Um, yeah, the, the really only the really real own only safe um, solution. Um, there's one, uh, van, uh, I guess, city squat spot um, somewhere in the Midwest. I'll just put that in the on the uh, put it that put that much. Um, there's one, uh, I guess, city squat spot um, on the Pasnia vetted directory map and directory right now. And something like that, um, I think, really the only feasibility. Like it's sometimes, if you're a nomad, you have to you you you'll have to find yourself in a city. You might as well. Um, like the only real safe alternative is finding like someone on the a trusted person on the Pasnia map and directory. And, uh, um, and this one offers proxy merchant services too. So if you just want to park your van 
um, and, uh, you know, have him, uh, you know, do some grocery shopping for you, for you or something like that. Um, that's on there. So I think that's really the, um, yeah, I'm with you. It's not, it's not really feasible, um, long-term, even, you know, shorter, you know, midterm. Uh, I don't think it's really like you, you go in the town to get what you need and you go, you, and you get out as quick as possible. And hopefully you can, you know, remain unmolested for, um, that day or two that you, you happen to find yourself, um, in a city. Cause yeah, any, anything long-term, I mean, yeah, it's, it's uh, becoming more and more demonized everywhere. Um, I talked to, I think I mentioned it to you, Kyle. I, I, I talked to, there are a couple of Europeans. Um, one lived on a, on a sailboat in a harbor for, t- for a decade, uh, ten, over 10 years. And uh, then uh, um, had a family and had to move back into conventional, I guess not really, didn't really have, you know, didn't have to, you know, quote unquote, but um, he found himself in a different living situation now. Um, but he d- does a lot of boating with his, one of his neighbors who's still, a, who's still living on a boat, Martin, who was also on the podcast. And he did the podcast from his boat. Um, really cool, um, really cool fellows. Um, but uh, so this uh, Martin also, so he splits time um, on his boat living in the harbor and uh and also as a van nomad um and he, he did uh he's done all sorts of you know long van nomad trips i think it's from like los angeles up to alaska um was his last as but it was, you know maybe 10 20 years ago when he said he was a little younger so he's an, he's an older man um but he's been doing this for for a long time and it's and from what he said uh it's even kind of worse um in in europe um it's like with a lot of the uh i guess uh, the war stuff going on with ukraine um because he used to not have to, you know, show, like he did, he, like going across borders in the used to be easy, but it's not easy anymore. Um, there's border checkpoints. And he said, "Yeah, the cops are, are you know, are, uh, are are cramping my style." And I was like, yeah, I, "I bet they are. Um, yeah, I definitely bet they are." Um, but it's it's even worse. Like a lot of a lot of times, if you're lucky, um, like cops don't like uh, even even the bludge don't like. If if they if they tow your car, there's a lot of paperwork that comes with that. If someone calls if someone calls them, usually it's like if you just move along, it's okay. Um, but you want to avoid that. But uh, in Europe, um, yeah, apparently they'll 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 literally just take your shit, um, <laughs> um, basically, and maybe they might toss you in jail too. Um, like it's not something that they that they're they're uh, you know real real happy with um, over there. So in some ways, van nomadism might be easier here in the here in the USSA. But um, yeah, I'm with you. The um, as far as it being being feasible in, in cities, I, I don't think that's. Um, yeah, unless it's, you know, like unless it's a small town in Mexico, but then that you run into like other issues such as like st- standing out and uh, standing out to you know potential private coercers. So yeah, I mean it's it'll you know it comes with its benefits and drawbacks. But um, <clears throat> yeah, I guess uh, a- anything else on uh, I guess Vanu and cities, uh, Vanu and cities with city squat spots. Um, I guess there's there's a couple other subs I guess subsets of Vanu and cities that I have, but I don't want to close this conversation out. If you have anything else. I mean, I was going to mention something about uh, I was also rethinking of the apartment situation as well. Go for it. Because that was a part of Vano and Cities as well. Yep. Yep. Okay. So I'm so very similar to the part of Vano and Cities that I'm drastically like reconsidering. I think also similar on a somewhat similar vein, perhaps less extremely serious in some sense, or, or, or shall we say the MTH is not quite as low, maybe, I and mean, even this is a debatable point, but again, I'm also used to Austin, so maybe this is an Austin thing, I don't know, maybe other places aren't quite as bad about, you know, lack of shelter issues, but I'm really rethinking, are, you know, is leasing an apartment really a practice of Vano? And here's the thing, so unless you're going to go on a paper trip, which is a completely different subject, a completely different set of skills. Not really related to Vanu. You could incorporate it into Vanu. It's a little bit closer to like three flag or five flag theory, which is what like a lot of the expats do and so forth. In some ways, it's closely related to that. But unless you're going to go on a freaking paper trip, which may or may not be illegal, because depending on how the identity of the identity laws work in whatever you know. And also depending on what, whatever form of jurisdictional arbitrage you may or may not decide to participate in, um, you know, wholly constructing a brand new legal identity out of whole cloth um, and or establishing a corporation that would then rent the apartment and sign the lease and all that, even if you were to do all of that and really have some, uh, shall we say, buffer space, right? It's John Doe didn't rent the ap- apartment. It's really, uh, you know, Timothy Smith that rented the apartment. If you're going on a paper trip or alternatively, oh, John Doe didn't rent the apartment. It's really Acme Corporation that rented the apartment. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. 
So even if you were to make all that happen, just hypothetically, just go with me on this. Even if you were to make that happen, um, it's still only one apartment. Um, really would be a better idea is like a network of safe houses, which would basically be a series of cheap apartments. But then again, how can anybody afford that? There's also the affordability issue. I mean, who can pay? So a lot of people can barely pay for one apartment, much less two or three or more. I mean, at that rate, it's cheaper to rent a house. So, you know, depend, depending on the whatever local area you're in and so forth. So, you know, and then, and then of course, we're, at the end of the day, we're, we're going back to MCH yet again. Again, in an apartment, it's not mobile. It is a fixed structure. Not only is it a fixed structure, it is a fixed structure where you are sharing a physical building with other people. Other people may or may not be engaging in illegal activity. Illegal activity that may or may not, again, this is not, we're not getting the victimless crime stuff. Put that aside for a second. The illegal activity may or may not attract the attention of a bludge. And especially if you have a cheap apartment of some kind, uh, and depending on the certain neighborhood and depending on the city and depending, depending on a whole bunch of other factors, the bludge may be visiting that particular apartment complex and even particular buildings within that apartment complex more frequently than they would otherwise. If you were in some overly gentrified place that was like in excess of like $3,000 a month or something for a one bedroom or something. You see what I mean? So, you know, there, there's a lot of considerations here, not just of a legal nature, but also of a financial one. But at the end of the day, even if you were to hop, skip, jump through all of that and somehow make it work practically, you're just, at the end of the day, with you trying to, you know, rent an apartment not in your illegal name and you figure out how to do it, even then you're still you're still using an apartment, right? Even if <laughs> so do, do, you do you remember do you remember the the no the no tell idea from hashtag Agora? The not a hotel from hashtag Sorry, Agora? Do you remember the um, the no tell the not a hotel from hashtag oh, Agora? Yeah. Um, that's I think. Um, right. sorry, sorry to jump in. That so I I, I talked to uh, um, JJ came on the podcast back in like 2019. We talked about um, that idea in quite quite substantial depth. But um, there is a um, I think the really the it comes down to proxy merchants, um, and it's it's, it's theoretical. I it's, so there's this uh, this motel um, in a nearby town, and um, it's uh, it's an old motel. Um, and it could probably, you could probably snag it pretty cheap. Um, honestly, like not even like for the amount of square footage and amount of rooms, um, you could probably snag it pretty cheap. Um, but anyway, if you think about it, uh, like something like that, um, the, no, the no tell idea comes in there where you could have, um, you know, if you don't want to have any, any, any interaction with a human being, uh, you can do it digitally. Um, you can get into rooms, you can have special, special, um, you know, special rooms for, um, uh, for, you know, self liberators for, uh, for volumes, vetted folks. And then you could still have a public facing, um, I guess a public por par uh, part of that too. Um, but there's so many, I think that that'd be kind of the, the way, um, uh, cause I mean, yeah, the like renting an apartment, um, you know, like the, the cost is usually, usually quite exorbitant you know, nowadays. I mean, it's a lot of reason people move into vans and such. It's why people are investigating these alternative lifestyles. Um, but yeah, the, the rent is high. The, I think the vulnerability is high just, um, from the fact that, you know, um, if you're in a big a big city like you know say Austin and you've got like a hundred quote unquote you know neighbors um, in your same area, there's a good chance that you know like this week the cops are going to be there for somebody in that you know in that apartment. What if they knock on your door for like on your, your door on accident or something? Um, like uh, um, yeah, I think it's it's yeah the, it's it's way you know it's it's very very vulnerable. Um, but I think something like um, um, yeah and and it would be like a, a, a lot of the Vani lifestyles even if they aren't um, like. Uh, I guess nomadic, um, they're semi, I guess, uh, um, semi permanent. So yeah, like, uh, um, I think that might be, it might be a potential way. Um, and then also the, the fact that, you know, apartment leases sometimes lock you down, um, legally for, obviously they lock you down legally for, you know, certain, uh, you know, lengths of contracts and such. Um, and then the privacy violations, you know, renting the apartments and, um, and all that. But, um, yeah, I, th I think, you know, I don't know. I still like that idea. It, it's for, you know, especially for a lot of, uh, you know, nomadic self liberators having, um, you know, um, having, you know, little motels like that. It's a, uh, um, it's, it's a, it's a great, I think very potentially profitable proxy merchant service. Um, and then still, uh, be able to, you know, still be able to, you know, have rooms that you, um, you know, rent out to the public. But, um, I don't know. It's something that's, uh, um, that I've thought about a number of times driving past it. Um, yeah. 
Well, I, I think you touched upon something there, which basically, as far as I understand, it kind of comes down to this. It, it really does, it depends on the landlord, right? If you have just some corporate landlord or just somebody, even if it was an actual human being landlord that's very much in the first realm, it's very much a part of the survival society, they're, you know, uh, on a good day, they're going to be kind of like a MPC businessman. On a bad day, they're going to be a slum board, right? That's, that's kind of the long and the short of that. Um, so unless your landlord is also a proxy merchant, like where you were kind of getting at, then your MTH is going to be pretty low on the most part. With with I mean I mean there's always exceptions, but like again we're talking broad terms here. And so yeah, for a proxy merchant to essentially be the landlord of say either a pro an actual property with multiple buildings or even if it was just one building, uh, that would be much better. And that way the tenants could be screened a lot better by your by that proxy merchant because again the proxy merchant would pretty much be on our side anyway. Right. And therefore. Yeah. And he and he could actually be paid like and he could actually he could even stick up he could even stick up to the bludge for you whereas like a a hotel manager or hotel you know owner um, or even a landlord a random landlord has no reason to, to to stick up for you for any stretch for any you know for any reason but the proxy merchant it could be he could get paid ten percent higher the rates could be set to a point where if the cops come he's gonna stick up for like he's gonna stick up for you um, to where he's not just gonna roll over and you know give you know give you know give permission so uh, yeah I, I, yeah. Sorry, this is bringing a lot of a lot of a lot of thoughts. And there's something we talk about privately, um, kind of regarding that. But um, I can't say much. I can't say anything else about it. But go ahead. I'm sorry. No. And, and by the way, I might as well give everybody a, a short preview of the upcoming private security series, which I still need to finish a few details on. Um, this actually dovetails with what some first from clients do when they do hire private security for a while do is issue something called lease violations. They kind of sort of look like tickets like the cops use or the bloods use, but instead they're just formal pieces of paper that basically are leaving a document trail in addition to the pictures that we take that when tenants are violating the terms of their lease, usually in the middle of the night because that's usually when this stuff kind of goes down, whatever it is. Um, you know, there's, there's, uh, that gets passed on to the client who is the landlord who then over time will have to make a decision because there are times where it's kind of like a one done and that's it. And then it's just like pay the fine and that's it to the, to the landlord. Then there's other times where it's over and over and over again. I mean, there have been tenants with some clients where it's not three strikes and you're out, although there are other ones that are. Um, there are ones where some tenants got over 10 lease violations and they haven't been evicted yet. Because they're because apparently they're on you know Section Eight housing something or another or there's some other sort of government intervention largest kind of thing going on. So what I'm trying to say is this: regarding getting an apartment using some sort of alias or using a corporation name as part of doing volume in city, I would agree with you that pretty much sticking to proxy merchants would have to be the case because to do it otherwise. You would either have to go on a paper trip or have a network of them that you could somehow afford. But even then, even if you could jump the hop, skip, jump through all of that, the other problem too is if a first realm servile society landlord decided to hire a private security, I know exactly what those guys would be doing because I used to be one of them. And they're looking for drunk and disorderly. They're looking for domestics. They're looking for people parking in fire lanes. They're looking for people who just park badly, like not in a parking space. You'd be surprised how often that happens, actually. Um, they're also looking for forceful signs of entry on, unsec on unsecured vacant apartment units, like some like a vagrant broke the door and it burglarized the place. Um, like there's certain specific things we're looking for, right? You could say some of that kind of dovetails into quality of life stuff, and that's fair, like when they're having the loud noise, the block party at 2 in the morning. But at the same time, remember, we're not cops. We're trying to enforce a contract. And part of that rental contract is they can't be doing bullshit after 10 p.m. Because 10 p.m. is quiet time. And quiet time means people have a, the other tenants have a reasonable expectation to enjoy the use of their respective rental units, which means that it needs to be quiet enough for everybody to go to fucking sleep. That's what that means. So if somebody decides to have a block party and then someone else's kid can't get to sleep and they've got school in the morning or something else going on or you got work in the morning, well, 
now we're going to have a conflict and tempers are going to get flared up and this is all happening, you know, when things are pitch black and you see it escalates and escalates and escalates and escalates. And how this dovetails back in the Vanu is, well, now the mean time of harassment has just dropped to fucking zero, which is the opposite of what we want. So, yes, doing some sort of thing with a, where the landlord is a, as a proxy merchant, I mean, yeah, they could still have private security for, for, for uh, other reasons, but it wouldn't be the same thing like I was doing where we're basically just, where basically the landlords decide to just let whoever the fuck in. And then law of averages being law of averages, somebody decided to do something in the middle of the night and the guys like me have to show up. And then and then we basically either do paperwork or we throw it down, sometimes both. But yeah, it's just kind of like if you just don't want to have problems if you're trying to reduce your vulnerability coercion, yeah, landlord being a proxy merchant is really the way to go if you're gonna do bottom cities. Just pump wash. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of it's just from the um, I mean, it's worse than political crusading, um, like the pri- privacy, you know, regarding the privacy, because, um, yeah, if you if you fill out just like an apartment lease, I mean, they're gonna hit your credit, they're gonna hit they're hit your credit score, they're gonna hit your, um, they're gonna hit all sorts of stuff, all, all sorts of stuff. So, um, yeah, uh, I guess I'll, I'll toss in one other random thing. I, oh, yeah, yep, go for it. Almost like you actually said something important, and I want to piggyback on that. The privacy, it's actually worse than that. It's not just about the credit score. It's not just about doing the background checks. When private security, oh, excuse me, when apartment, private apartment security is called in or they're doing their normal patrols and they just run across stuff, as both have happened, at, at least with me, um, we have every contractual right to demand identification from tenants, which means when any one of us, and this has happened, and I've gotten up in people's faces about it, and other times they were more cooperative, I've had the range happen. But when I ask for identification, I need to see some, go- I need to see some state-issued, government-issued identification of some kind. Okay? I've had people show me library cards and other stuff. I'm like, no. Give me passport, driver's license. Um, I think we would even accept, uh, but it's got to have like your name and your face on it. Is is what we is what our training was at that one specific uh, security company that shall go unnamed at this time. Would you accept a Mexican uh, driver's license? Our, so it's funny you mentioned about I'm the just curious. Stuff because I'm sorry. Would you accept a Mexican driver's license for identification? Yes, of course. I, okay. Yes, so mine would be mine would be valid. Then. That's good to know. <laughs> I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. I was just saying my Mexican driver's license would be valid. Then that's good to know. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Basically, what what we were taught. Now, again, the bludgeon and the cops are different. But what we were taught was that as long as it's got a face, a name, uh, yeah, uh, you know, face on the piece of identification and a name and so forth, and as long as it was issued by a governmental entity, a state entity, you know, so that's the state is a part of it. Then yeah, we can accept it as a valid form of identification. We can't accept. Oh, I had a lady give me uh, as a side note. We had a lady give me a voter a voter card because she was um, she had, uh, she said she left her visa back in her apartment, but she had her voter card on her. I'm like, ma'am, no, get your passport. And then she went up and got her passport, and we were good. So yeah, whatever the form of the state issued identification is, long well, got a you know it's picture ID. That's the main thing we're looking for. It's picture ID because we look at the the reason why Shane is in our training, when we were set in as well as the face of the person in front of you, and if they look dramatically different, not just look, because people change, right, over years, right? I mean, some pictures are like 10 years old, right? You know, try, try to be a little understanding of the people's weight change and so forth, right? Um, but if it's like dramatically different, if it doesn't look the same, then that's uh, grounds for identity theft, and then we would have to get the cops involved, because now this is escalating into a felony. You see how that works? Yeah. Hmm. So, in terms of like the meantime of harassment issue and all that, and and also as you were getting at the specific privacy issue, it's actually way worse than what you just said. Yes, there is the issue about getting the apartment where you have to do the background check and do the credit score, and that takes forever. It's even worse if the apartment security because if anything goes down, and guys like me show up and demand to see identification, the first problem is people refusing. Well, then that gets added on the lease violation. We can't cuff anybody for that. It's not severe enough. It's also not within our so-called arrest authority to do that. That's for felonies um, and disturbances of the peace and, of course, uh, uh, theft. Um, but also known as the shopkeeper's privilege. But 
Uh, but if somebody refuses to produce ID and they just say no, because I've had that happen several times with tenants, then we just add it on the lease violation. It's like another 50 bucks or whatever it was. Hmm. Um, but even when you produce identification, I've had people, you know, I, I've seen I've seen passports, I've seen driver's licenses, I've seen state issued other types of things. And so yeah, like what if you've got one got your face on it, name on it, and the face more or less matches, we consider it valid. So even even if it was four, as long as it looks good enough, especially at night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The whole point of this vulnerability is coercion. Let's increase the MCH. I mean, do you really want to be in a scenario where you're going to have to argue with a security guard in the middle of the night as to whether you're a tenant and whether the form of identification you're producing, even if you're being cooperative, is not forged? Do you see what I mean? <laughs> Yeah. So a little, a little tidbit. It's funny you mentioned, um, you know, from digitizing these um, old Vanu zines like a, a goddamn lunatic over the past four or five months. Um, but yeah, back in Vanu Life, they talk about paper tripping some Vanu Life and Vanu Link. And uh, it's funny, like one of the very first steps, one of the easiest pieces of, of identification that's accepted nowadays is a voter ident- voter registration card. Um, like that'd be like the first thing, like if you're establishing your, um, you know, like wh- what you're trying to do is basically create a, a paper trail. Um, and one thing leads to, to the next. You can use a voter registration card for like your driver's license or something like that. Um, and so like, a lot of this stuff isn't necessarily valid anymore. But there are some things where it's like you know, I th- you know, I, I if that would be a justifiable reason for a Vanuan or self liberator to get a voter registration card, um, if they had to do something like that. I I, I think, uh, or if they were you know going going down that sort of path. But um, yeah, again, that's that's uh, that might be a different conversation for another. Yeah, go for it. It, it is a different conversation. The last thing I'll say about it for now is that if somebody wanted to start doing their own little like research homework thing, take a look at the infamous I nine form that's used by so many employers because it's all the federal stuff. Um, take a look at what the feds consider to be well, the, the class A identification, the class B identification, mm-hmm. and basically work it backwards. It, and we're not going to go into details here, but basically look at the I-9 form list and then work it backwards in terms of a human, of a hypothetical human being that would hypothetically, that would be born to parents or, or you know, caregivers, whatever. And then, and then how, how, what is, what would be the different legal documents they would need to obtain during their childhood that their legal guardians would, would get for them up until they become 18 and so forth so that they could get a job when they're, uh, or, you know, even as teenagers, right? Um, what what would be those steps? And if you can figure that out, you're pretty much two-thirds of the way on how to do paper tripping. Because after that, after you understand how everything's put together. And by the way, a lot of things changed after 9-11. True. It was actually a lot easier to go on a paper trip and do it successfully before 9-11. A lot of laws got changed, and it wasn't just the Patriot Act. That was part of it. That tightened up a lot of the requirements about what counted as certain forms of, of legal identification in some circumstances. So, for example, you could use, it might still be the case now, but again, I'm not a lawyer, I don't play one on TV, you check your local laws kind of thing. But last time I heard and checked, and even a bureaucrat told me this even somewhat recently, under certain circumstances, a utility bill could be considered proof of residence for some types of applications, but not for others. So, like when Franz Kafka wrote his unfinished novel of the castle, which I highly recommend to anybody, which is really just really more of an allegory, kind of exploring the horrors, the eldritch abomination that is bureaucracy, just as a concept. Never mind, he has an institution, which would of course irk somebody like Henry David Thoreau, and did because he said so in his writings. You really have to understand the mechanics of how the state works so that when you're trying to increase your MTH, you can basically kind of hop, skip, jump around whatever they're doing and not get in trouble while doing it. Remember, the reason why, and this is a very important historical point, if you take nothing else away from today's broadcast, it is this. The reason why the sovereign citizens, so-called, went to jail repeatedly even when they change their titles and all that, and they're American national tomorrow, and they're free men in the language of the Canadian version, and so on and so forth. When the sovereign citizens, etc., kept going to jail, 
it's because they did not understand how the laws of the state worked functionally on a practical level. They claim they did. They claim that Uniform Commercial Code was how you bought your way to freedom. They claimed about you know re redeeming your straw man and all these lies, full-blown lies that I've written about at length. And so what they did ironically, which is a cautionary tale to everybody else with a brain left, is basically what the sovereign citizens, et cetera, did was that they reduced their MCH all the way down to zero, which is why the feds wrote multiple intelligence documents, which have since become public, saying that the sovereign citizens are basically paper terrorism was a new term that was coined specifically addressing what they were doing with filing the false claims against judges and, and other government agents. Because the sovereign citizens claimed they knew how the law worked because they were very, very arrogant. And of course, they don't like me very much for other reasons. So if you're going to try and use legal interest devices in, in any manner, whether it's paper tripping or in some other manner, you've got to know what the state laws are and then hop, skip, jump as best you can. And even then, the stuff that's not 100%, you can still sort of, you know, bludge and still put the cuffs on you if they think it's serious enough, if it makes them, if it, if it serves their interest enough. And I say this not to scare anybody. I see this as very much in the spirit of be gentle as doves, but wise as serpents kind of thing. You know, mm -hmm. this is not, none of this is without any risk. There's always risk when you're trying to gain any sort of freedom or volume and so forth. It's just, let's take things one step at a time and really think this out. And then, yes, we do need to do that. Okay, your audio cut out. Maybe you stop talking. I didn't think you were done with your sentence. Yeah, um, yeah, um, yeah, I, I hear you now. Um, yeah, I hear you now. <clears throat> so, may, okay, maybe you're, oh, yeah, well, maybe you're, maybe you're finished speaking. Okay, I, okay, I wasn't sure if it was, uh, it was a, it was kind of a weird drop off. <clears throat> maybe you just stopped, maybe you just stopped talking, and there's a weird, weird overlap. But, um, no, that's, um. Yeah, that's that's uh yeah valuable stuff for sure, man. Um, I guess there so there was um uh so we've been going for like forty eight minutes. Um, oh gosh, I I, I guess I did, I did want to mention that. Um, so um, I guess we'll we'll stick with the the legal. It, it it is it is relevant. We won't we won't move forward uh, move forward quite yet. Um, but you're talking about um. You know, like you got to go look at you got to look go look at at you got to go read the laws, read the statutes, um, and actually figure out what they what they say and what they don't say. Um, and uh, this was I remember back when I was you know um, like uh, for my my jury summons back in 2014 or 15, whenever it was 2015, I think it was early 2015. And uh, um, I tried to look at like, well, what's the violent like? What am I going to be charged with if I don't go? And um, I looked, you know, I read through all the statutes, called the called the assholes to the bureaucrats, and no one had any answers. No one, no one knew. And basically, I just I had to kind of assume that it would just be, um, um, what's it called? Um, oh God, where it's basically it's up to the judge. Um, uh, oh God, was I? I don't know. Why I can't remember the, the the term now. Where basically they just they just the judge puts you, you know, basically just puts you in jail for not for not showing up. Um, and it's it's a common thing that the judge can do, but I, I should remember the, the legal term for it. Um, but so that, that that's one instance, and then there's another. I won't go into very. I won't go into too much detail at this point. But um, I, I was trying to figure out what the like what the just because you know like it, at at that time my, my driver's license was expiring and I didn't know what it was, so I, I went to the Illinois statutes <clears throat> and um, like read the the relevant sections. It's not that long. It's only like you know weird Kyle it's actually not that long it took like 10 minutes to read and I read it like six times to make sure I didn't miss anything and uh there was nothing um about nothing in there about expired driver's licenses suspended yes <clears throat> but that's different than um suspended for like not paying child support or um you know not showing up you know like uh for you know like 12 DUIs or something like that like where they sus actually suspend your license for a reason but expired um they didn't say anything about that so I, I wasn't sure um and I did get an answer on that um but it took a it took a you know it took a traffic stop, um, but uh, and one that went well. Um, and uh, long story short, the Mexican driver's license prevailed. Um, God bless it. But uh, yeah, so t to your point, yes, even if you go and look at it, you might still not have an answer. And um, 
then yeah from, from from then on it's it's just the social engineering aspect of it um whether you're talking about you know kind of the hacking the hacking angle of that with social engineering which is very which is very popular there but um social engineering as in <clears throat> like you're talking about getting the documentation might not even be the hardest part the hardest part is you stepping up and fucking owning it um can you play the part can you play the role and can you convince whoever you're talking to whether it's a bludge or whether it's a uh you know a landlord or whoever can you convince them that you are who you say say you are and uh um and that sort of thing and some people are too truthful and they can't you know they can't do that um even if it's totally moral and justified, because there's no reason that this person has any reason to have that information whatsoever. Um, it's a, it's like ethical enclave trader versus agorist. Again, kind of the, the same sort of thing. Um, like people have a right to ask for this information. If you give them information that may not necessarily be correct, um, they're the ones. I mean, uh, they're they're already dialogically stopped, right? Speaking in terms of argumentation ethics, but yeah, I'll, I'm curious what you have in, what you have to say. In, I guess what, what you have to what you have in return here. That so dropped a lot. I see what you're saying. Um, the only thing I can really add on to that for now is just, again, to go back to what I said at least a few times now, the whole point is to increase mean time to harassment. At the end of the day, when it comes to practice of Vanu, that is what in the first realm was referred to as KPI or key performance indicators. Major corporations have this. Amazon had it in terms of DPPA or deliveries per uh, you know, deliveries per credit hour. There's all sorts of acronyms with the different the different things And I think trying to make the decision as to what counts and what does not count as a valid increase in the error pulled out. Um, I try to be careful about it and so forth. Um, that's why I don't really describe numbers. Um, it's more relative, um, at least in some sense. Now, but we're also trying to kind of also apply MTH to stuff that he didn't talk about too, and that's how we push the development of of Vonnie forward. Mm -hmm. Is really trying to kind of pick up where he left off, as, as you said. The the issue of legal intersections to be used just to legal intersections, as Old Man Rayo put it, really brings about liberty, not violence. So it's kind of it's kind of like another balancing act, right? It's not that the liberty is bad. It's just that it's temporary. It's also depending on, and much like he said, depending on, yeah, again, going back to like the apartment thing. Okay, so like going back to the nomadism and city squad spots, we're not really relying on legal interest. Like, this is actually the comparison. We're not really relying on legal interest like, so much for fucking policy, technically. Um, so that's kind of very different contrasted with all the apartment stuff, where, yes, actually we are relying on legal intersight to, to greater or lesser degree. Um, but yeah, I don't know, man. I just... I think I think at the end of the day, with whatever we're trying to kind of figure out and try to make judgments on, we just need to be really, really, really careful. Um, there's also a lot of stuff that hasn't really been kind of explored either. I mean, how many, how many underground cities exist can we comfortably talk about, even publicly, that exists that are functional and actually have some degree of really good security, right? Thank you. Great. Yeah. But are great. Also great. Great question. Yeah. No. A great. You know, that's that is a a, a great question um, for sure. Because I was just kind of thinking, we got like about five minutes left, and um, we're not going to even get to this. Is going to be like a four or five part series, which I guess as we did in the entire season one and season two, plan those out. Um, that's probably how it's going to be. This is probably like, like a six part series of, you know, revisiting all the Vanu shelters. Cause we, this might just be a e-bikes and Vanu and cities episode. Um, and then we'll, we'll get to the, you know, the, I guess the last few, um, you started talking about underground shelters and that is one, um, I've been looking into that a lot from obviously going through the Vanu life, uh, literature. Um, and I've just put out, uh, basically all the, like, uh, an audio, an audio podcast of all of the literature out, um, at that time, um, on 
you know, building underground structures. So I think I think technology can really, really help um, to make some of those hurdles that they were dealing with back then um, actually possible to, to engineer past. Um, but for just to, to, to say we're closing out Vanuan cities here, um, there was another example. Um, and again, this isn't something that I would rely upon um, at all. And you have to have the inside knowledge um, to know that, like where these, you know, these safe havens exist, per se, quote unquote, safe havens. Um, but uh, so I've got it on screen here um, for the um, for the viewers at uh, on Odyssey or Fascist Tube. But uh, I stumbled across this on YouTube, and it was uh, basically something about a roof ninja. Um, this uh, this lady was living in a um, uh, so you know like in like a grocery like grocery stores um, like on on the roof they have like their signs. Well, a lot of those are actually like structures you could live in like they're made like they, they've got to be you know closed for maintenance and um and there's they're kind of like maintenance you know like a storage closet something like that well this lady uh, or this is i say this lady this I, she's probably early 20s or something she found herself in a really coercive situation um as some of the others that i guess are in this sort of i guess ninja collective this you know so-called ninja collective and um she was living in this grocery store sign for an entire year um, she had like an entire mini apartment. She had a Keurig in there. Um, like it was a kind of an ordeal to get all her shit off the roof and they weren't exactly how she was sure how she was getting up there to begin with. Um, but it was, so as like a really radical, um, I guess a radical example of Bonnie, Bonnie cities, which is not practical really, I don't think for anybody, but, um, I mean, geez, like, yeah, that's, uh, that's crazy. Can you imagine living in a grocery, like unavoided for an entire year, um, coming and going, um, you know, working, like working every day, um, you know, carrying on your normal life from a grocery store sign in a city. Um, like, I don't know, there, there's some, there's some folks who never heard about Vanu, um, or self liberation or anything like that, but just out of necessity, like these things, um, yeah, they become, become realities. Um, but yeah, something, I guess a little lighter and, and, uh, I guess less serious to close out with, but, um, you know, living in a grocery store sign for, for a year, um, well, yeah, I guess Vonnie and City is not necessarily feasible um, would be the conclusion to our discussion today, Kyle. Um, other than maybe, uh, you know, every nomad needs access to a city sometime, and if you need access, then find a proxy merchant at, your, at uh, the Pasnia vetted map and directory. Public one coming, so maybe there'll be someone there. But, um, yeah, for those 30 or 40 folks that have access to that private map and directory, uh, you can find uh, one or two or three or something on there. Um, that would fall into this category, but, um, anyway, Kyle, um, 58 minutes so far. Um, I guess any close, any closing thoughts, anything you want to leave out on before we, uh, before we, I guess, leave it for part three. Uh, not as of right now. I think I've said all I need to say uh, for now for this episode. Right on, right on. Um, well, uh, yeah, anyway, I think that was, uh, yeah, again, never really, never really know exactly how an episode is going to go or how much we're going to get through, but, um, I always enjoy it. And, uh, um, you know, from how many people asked about you when you're gone. Um, I know, uh, you know, our longtime listeners definitely, definitely appreciate having you back and, and having these conversations. So, <clears throat> all right. So there we have it guys closing out, uh, this part two of Vani shelters and, uh, Vani home base is revisited. Let me flip over here on OBS. Um, there we go. Uh, so yeah, I guess next week we will uh, get to. Uh, I'll refresh myself on the underground shelters and semi underground structures, uh, the troglodytism things. Um, we'll talk about radical housing, uh, decommissioned aircraft carriers, uh, floating hotels like the Marinia Project, the uh, the now defunct Marinia Project that I was involved with for uh, a short time, and uh, then uh, yeah, I guess uh, permanent, semi permanent uh, Vanu home bases like national communities, off grid homesteading, which would be the transition point. Uh, into the great Pasnia rundown, which I've never actually given. And, um, yeah, I think I, I don't know if everyone knows what's the vision still coming together. But anyway, hopefully next week we'll actually get to the great Pasnia rundown. Um, with, uh, with, you know, we've got a lot of the Pasnia services marketplaces available now, which didn't exist in the past year or two. Um, at least, yeah, until January of this year. So there's a lot of, a lot of updates and a lot happening. Um, and the vision's coming together. I just need to make the vision more clear so people know what the, what the hell's going on? Um, but anyway, yeah, that's all we have for you today. Uh, Vanupodcast.com is a place to go for all things Vanu. Uh, you can find our entire podcast archives, uh, free Vanu books, articles, audiobooks, uh, and much more. Uh, check out LibertyAntarctic.com for books, bundles, audiobooks, health and wellness tools like the Pain Liberator, uh, privacy tools, uh, ghost pads and ghost phones, uh, and much more. 
And uh, please do consider checking out the Free Republic uh, by visiting Paznia, P-A-Z-N-I-A, dot com. And uh, we do hope you'll get involved in one fashion or another. If you want to uh, jump the gun on the Paznia, the great Paznia rundown, uh, you can just go and, uh, you know, take a, a good in-depth uh, look at the website um, and uh, go from there. Um, and finally, if you have any topic suggestions uh, or questions for a Q&A with Kyle now that, uh, that he's back, uh, feel free to get them over. Uh, I think we've only done like one or two Q&As at all, and I'm not even sure if Kyle's been there for... Um, been there for any of them. It might have been Jason Booth, but um, yeah, send him over. Uh, email shanelibertac.com uh, or DM wherever is convenient. Uh, thanks so much for your time today. Until next time, cheers. Hello, friends, fellow self liberators. Dr. Gatherer here coming to you with a health and wellness message. The pain liberator. Miracle Muscle Pain Reliever is now back in stock at libertyunderattack.com. For your basic aches and pains, to more extensive injuries, and even pains like headaches or migraines, the Pain Liberator is here to liberate you from discomfort. The Pain Liberator is a 20% DMSO, dimethyl sulfoxide, slash 80% colloidal silver water base, blended with enough aspirin to provide 30 milligrams of aspirin per spray. Beyond just pain relief, all three of these main ingredients provide enormous benefit to the body in general. DMSO also helps to bring the aspirin and colloidal silver into the skin for maximum bioavailability. Individual benefits include, colloidal silver is antibacterial, antifungal, used for sore throats, sinus problems, tooth infections, and candida overgrowths. DMSO has over 40 known pharmacological properties, helps with acne, heals shingles, is radio slash EMF protective, painkiller, and heals stroke and heart attack damage. Aspirin is one of the safest, cheapest miracle drugs in existence. Searching PubMed, it assists with basically every disease or imbalance, from muscle pain, to reversing cancerous tumors and everything in between. Spray directly on head for headaches. The Pain Liberator is available via Liberty Under Attack publications. Just visit libertyunderattack.com slash pain to place your order today. PayPal, Bitcoin, and Monero accepted. For Monero, email shane at libertyunderattack.com. The Pain Liberator, Miracle Muscle Pain Reliever a Pasnia Department of Health and Wellness Creation. Liberty under attack at com slash pain.